you already know him. He contributes to open source projects since 2005. Mm -hmm. And he's the author of many drafts and comments in, dis in discussions within the core ITF working group. Uh, he's also a co-chair of the CBOR working group. And of course, he's a maintainer of Riot. And today he will give an overview of IT, uh, sorry, IETF security features like ACE, OSCOR, ad hoc, and SUIT. Yeah, and the stage is yours, Christian. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, just to check, do you see me? Do you hear me? You yes, see I see you. I see the slides. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, Maybe a little bit louder. Um, I can try to move that. Better now? Minimal. Okay, then I'll just do it like this. Um, so, uh, since 10 minutes ago, we know that we can't rely on the network and the fact that some that all those transmissions happen super fast uh, to keep our uh, network traffic confidential and to ensure that only people uh, that really are uh, that we really want to receive data from are sending that. Um, what I'd like to introduce today is methods in the core ecosystem that help us secure uh, constrained networks. This is both about how to secure things for the application from end to end, but also about how to secure things on the radio level with a focus on, on six low pan and how these all things all can play together into Riot. Now, if you've been here uh, three years ago, I've introduced the, uh, the core stack which is basically everything around co-op. And it still roughly looks the same with a few components that have now matured, that have been released. Um, but today we won't talk about all of this, um, but we will focus on the, on the security relevant components, which is not to say that there can't be security issues with the others, but these in particular are the ones that help us ensure that everything around here is um, being transferred the right way. Um, now, this image is not particularly suitable for discussing how this works in, um, in an operating system like RAD. So um, I'd like to use a different visualization this time, which looks roughly like this. Um, so we'll go through uh, co-op as an exercise first to look at what it can do and how it works for um, how, this, how this visualization works. And from there, we can go into all those um, all those, all those other components. So co-op from an operating system point of view it, or from, a, from an application developer point of view is a thing that uh, converts uh, request and response semantics over here um, down, to, uh, uh, down to some socket interface, which in, in our case will usually be UDP. It works over a few other interfaces, but um, for the sake of simplicity, let's, look, let's think of this as UDP. In a concrete setup, this might look like this. We have a constraint device over here. The application there uh, receives requests and produces responses. Those go through a co-op stack, which sends the messages over a network. And on the other side, there's a co-op stack again. And what the application sees is a request response pattern. This is kind of the, the, the minimal graphic here without security. Uh, of course, that on that link, there can be all kinds of devices. So for example, there might be routers in between. This might all happen on the same network, on different networks. There might be even proxies in between, which uh, terminate the co-op connection, might look up results in a, in a cache, um, but are otherwise transparent to the co-op traffic, which is why they are still using the same signature here. So co-op comes in, co-op goes out, co-op goes in, co-op goes out again. With that out of the way, let's look at how we can secure all this. The protocol that I want to start with, because I think it's the most, um, the, the simplest in terms of components, is the OSCO protocol. And this too is something that I've uh, presented here three years ago. Um, OSCO, again, from the library point of view, is a thing that turns uh, request response patterns, that requests and responses that come in into requests and responses that go out. And in doing so, it needs a uh, provide key, which is a symmetric key. That means that both the sender and the receiver have to share some key. 
and it needs to keep track of how many operations it has done, basically a sequence number that has to be persisted throughout its operation or throughout the operation of one particular key. Um, what it doesn't need is to interact with any other layers. So it can be, it's, it's co-op in, co-op out, and thus we can use it over all transports that use co-op, whether that's co-op over TCP, co-op over UDP, co-op over web sockets, and it also doesn't matter whether that's multicast. I mean, there is, so OSCore has modifications for multicast, which is group OSCore, but conceptually, um, conceptually it's still the same, same kind of, kind of protection. Um, of course, things can, uh, can be protected on a different layer too. So this is on, on the, basically on the application layer. Uh, when we use DTLS, especially as depicted here, DTLS with a pre-shared key, that takes datagrams left and produces datagrams right, uh, roughly. So it uses this socket interface. And other than OSCOR, it has, uh, it, it uses entropy to ensure that we are using a, we are using a fresh context and not, um, ca not a counter that needs to be persisted all the time. Um, a third layer in which things can be protected is the, is the link layer. Um, in particular, I'm looking at 6 this year, so we don't have this in kind of native Riot. There's the open WSN uh, library, which provides all of 6 -tish. Um, but we have at least the basic protections um, also in, in Riot. Uh, this is similar to the others in that we have a shared key. In this case, the key is shared amongst all participants of the network, and we have a sequence number. And the sequence number is not persisted on the device, but it, it's a property of the network. So in six low, in six tish, uh, there is this um, this concept of an absolute um, slot number, which is basically the number of uh, message slots that have occurred since this whole network was set up. Uh, this practically never wraps, and this is used to produce a nonce. So let's look at how this um, would look in a in a full setup. And this is kind of the the first of those big pictures. We're going to um, elaborate from this, but we're using the same basic set setup as before. So we have a device on the left, we have an application on the right, and before data gets serialized, or let's start with a request here. Before data even gets serialized into UDP, it passes through OSCore where it is encrypted and um, basically encrypted and connected or put through authenticated encryption. Then it is put onto the, uh, onto the UDP stack by the co-op layer, routed across the network, put onto a six loop pan network, which is basically that part here. In that network, all the participants have to share this key depicted in blue and then it gets decoded through the co-op stack and decrypted by an OSCore stack that shares the same key as the application here. So if we had different clients, then we would have different keys here, one for each client. Um, this gives what I'd call the, the kind of minimal essential security. So we can make sure that no party participates in the network that's not allowed to, uh, we can make sure that the messages we send uh, arrive at the destination without any tempering, without um, reordering that would actually disturb the semantics. Um, but it's a bit hard to deploy. So for one, uh, for one, if we want to kick out any of these devices from the network, we'll have to rekey the whole network. And so far, we've distributed all these keys manually. Would which might, for example, be at flashing time in, in the riot case. And also we have to commission each and every device with key, uh, symmetric keys with all the applications. And moreover, we have to keep those pesky counters. Um, this is all manageable and at least uh, except at, um, and can all be implemented on riot, um, but operations could be a bit smoother. Uh, so just to check how we are in time, yeah, we'll still fit. So let's go on uh, and start from the lower end this time. How do we get to 
this distributed these distributed keys um, for the six loop hand network when we um, when we don't want to program them onto each individual device. And one protocol that was quite recently published, um, RFC 9031, so we are now, I think the latest number is something about 9050, so this is really, really recent, is the constraint joining protocol for 6-Tish. What this does is it uh, introduces a component called the, the coordinator, which is a party on the network, which might be the border router or might be separate of that. And each device that we want to join into the network has to have its own individual OSCOR key with that, uh, with that coordinator. And through such, such a secure channel, the, uh, the device that joins the network can access the coordinator and can receive from the coordinator the currently recent key and also confirmation of the sequence number in order to um, get everything that's needed on the network. And if the network gets rekeyed, um, all the devices can just use the same symmetric material they have with the coordinator again and get the new key material. Works in both directions. For the application, um, the closest similar thing that I think will be really usable, um, I'm just reading that I might be on the wrong microphone. Um, do you hear that? Yeah, everything is good. OK, then I'll just <laughs> have to keep that a bit closer. Unfortunately, I'm on an Android device where I can regulate volume in any different way. Um, OK, I, yeah. I just increased the volume basically to max. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when we are uh, talking about how to get the application keys, um, there is a different approach that's uh, that that probably going to be taken. That is the one introduced in the ACE OSCOR profile. Now, ACE is a thing that's primarily concerned with authorization. So, we have different comp uh, devices that authenticate towards this ACE server and that have trust relations with that. Where the ACE server might be a device on the network that might be your cell phone, something that is basically the the root of the, the root of of our configuration, and um, and 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 this is and this and this server is what is getting us the the additional key material. This can be used in different roles. So what we see depicted here um, around the ACE OSCO profile is for one we can be in the um, in the resource server role. In this case, we don't talk directly to the ACE server at all. We just have some pre-shared key with the ACE server, and we will receive CBOR web tokens um, encrypted with that, and I'll come in a moment back to what these are precisely. Um, if you're in the, uh, in the client role, then you will usually talk to the ACE server directly and ask the server for key material that you could later use, and this connection is Again, as most things are here, co-op, and it's basically up to you or basically up to the to the deployer to find a suitable way to have a pre-existing uh, protected communication. In most cases, what will dock over here uh, will be an OSCore connection, but it could just as well be a DTLS connection. When that protocol, um, when the client has obtained such an um, all the relevant information, the peers, that is the client and the resource server talk through co-op again, which does not necessarily need to, and usually is not protected. And then they obtain some shared key material and a counter that now starts at zero. <clears throat> and we'll see in a moment how this all integrates with the network. But before that, I promised that I'll tell you a bit about those SIBO web tokens. SIBO web tokens are the like co-op is the kind of constrained equivalent of HTTP. SIBO web tokens are the equivalent of JSON web tokens, and thus they are self-contained um, data items that carry authorization and can be transported over the network um, without being terribly secret. 
these are all expressed in um, in a system called COSI. And again, if you're familiar with the large web, uh, you might do the familiar pattern and replace the C with a J, and then you get Jose or Josie. And that would be a JSON object signing and encryption. And COSI is really um, just the same, but with um, optimizations for the small message sizes that we need in the constraint networks. So it's really short identifiers. Uh, there's one more thing that COSI can do for us, um, probably similar to, to COSI again. Um, that is, it can serve as, an, as a building block for many other components. So for example, um, one thing that I won't go into detail here for reasons of time is that is the suit, uh, which was mentioned earlier, the suit framework, the, the firmware updates for the, for the Internet of Things. Um, a piece of firmware that is distributed through a suit is protected by those very mechanisms that also protect CBO web tokens and that are used as part of OSCORE. So really these are generic building blocks, which also means that we can share a lot of code between the components. That is, um, an OSCORE implementation and a suit implementation don't all have to ship their own crypto, but they can, <clears throat> uh, they can use the same functionality. And one more thing that COSI gives us is it makes it really easy to use different algorithms so that when we deploy um, devices for a long time, we can ship completely distinct uh, cipher suites. And if one of those happens to be compromised, then we can just switch over to the other uh, without any undue delay. Now taking those components into the, into the picture of before again, we now have a new uh, a new player here that is that join registrar and coordinator, and really some component like this um, needs to be present already in any six dish network because someone has to keep track of those um, of those absolute slot numbers. So this might be this might be joined with the border router or may, might be a separate component. And the other major new player is the authorization server, and. Here it's good to point out that the authorization server does not need to be on the network all the time. And um, as we'll see in a moment, it also doesn't need to talk to all components, uh, to all other parties. So if we play through the communication of before again, our application now sees the device but does not have the security context yet, but it has pre-commissioned a security context with the authorization server because this is kind of where we can start from now. We don't need fixed keys for every device and every application, but we just, um, like n times m, but we just need some a trust relationship between the, uh, the application and the AS and then a trust relation between the device and the ES. We have n plus m and not n times m uh, keys to manage. Uh, so those already have a, a communication pattern here. The application can ask through ACE OSCO profile for key material that can be used with the device. Such a, a web token is, is uh, created and sent over. And then the application can, through unprotected co-op here, because it's not running through any, OS, any later OSCore, um, talk to the equivalent OSCore, uh, ACE OSCore profile on the other end, put in the SIBO web token, that was protected with the key material shared between the device and the application, uh, the authorization server. And now both parties share this red key here and commu can communicate without having any prior knowledge of each other. In a similar fashion, uh, the six dish network, now this uh, key in, in light blue, does not need to be pre-provisioned, but just each participant, the border router, as well as the device, need to have their own C, um, context with the, uh, with the uh, JRC, the coordinator. They talk this uh, constraint joining protocol to that. Um, and from that receive key material, which they can then use to secure communication on the link layer. Um, this is a lot better than before because now we can add devices just by flashing something onto them and exchanging information with the authorization server or the GRC uh, before we do that. So we create a new key and we share that between the, uh, between the respective trust centers 
and the device. It would still be nicer if, and that's kind of the third and last um, picture that I'd like to paint here, we had a way to um, have key material on the devices and on the applications that does not need to know from the start um, where this will be deployed. So that we can go from this one touch setup where we have to know where we are and then um, put something into the device or into the application to a zero touch setup where we do everything in software provided we have all the, the right key material and all the right authorizations. And that is most easily done if we introduce a new component that is public private key cryptography. Now, I would be really glad if there were um, some established symbol symbology for um, public and private key uh, cryptography. Turns out there isn't much. So what I'm using here is the actual finger that you usually don't share with others, um, representing um, private key material and the fingerprint, which you can prove that um, identifies you by printing it on somewhere uh, without actually handing out your finger. And again, starting with the, with the easiest component here, um, let me introduce ad hoc, which is the main topic of the Lake Working Group and the ITF. And the purpose of ad hoc is to create some kind of symmetric key material from um, asymmetric key material in a very, very compact way. So um, exchanging this on, even on very constrained networks should only just take two round trips with very uh, uh, a single round trip, so one back, one forth of messages, um, which should not be fragmented too badly. So we're talking about a few hundred bytes of, of data that's exchanged here. And then the parties that previously only knew of the um, public identity of that other party have mutual authentication and have key material they can use henceforth. Um, of course, as we had before, um, that's not the only way to do things. Um, a very widespread way of getting shared key material into networks at deployment time is EEP, the Extensible Authentication Protocol. And if you haven't heard of that, um, you've certainly used it because this is what's happening in a Wi-Fi, no matter whether you input a, a, a WPA2 passphrase or whether you input a user a certificate or a user and password if you're, for example, authenticating towards um, Eduroam, in which case this is using TLS as a backend. Um, this has backends for SIM cards. So even, even your cell phone communication is authenticated using that. Um, if there were a good picture of a kitchen sink, I would put it in there. Um, sure enough, you can also use um, TLS on its own. It's a bit tricky to use TLS in all the situations that I would like to use them here because it's on, it's on, it's acting on the UDP or TCP layer uh, level and not on the co-op level, which rules out, for example, uh, proxies in between, unless they are super trusted. But there is ongoing work to um, apply to, to shape TLS in such a way that it can be used on the application layer and then again, give you all those nice properties in a, in a way that is usable, sim similar to, to ad hoc. I won't use those in the, in the kind of last big picture, um, but I think it's reasonable to, to imagine that many of the components can be swapped out here and it has to be seen what will prevail. I think that the, the ad hoc approach is a very good one for the kind of devices we're talking about here. Um, in the interest of time, I'll skip over Bruski, um, but Michael Richardson is around and he can tell you more about why you don't always need to use the certificates that are on the device commissioned by the manufacturer, um, but want to turn them into something that you can use, um, you can use in your own domain as well. And last but not least, um, all of this um, uh, ACE and ad hoc can be combined in a really efficient way to get us from a certificate that might even indicate just this is that device from that vendor and someone has additional information about it right down to to the key material that we need for later OSCOR. This is designed for but not exclusively usable by the constraint joining protocol and how that's done is shown here. 
And this is basically the last picture I'd like to show today. Um, so now, rather than rolling out uh, all kinds of symmetric keys, we roll out asymmetric keys. Those can even be shared um, between uh, components of the device. So the same key could be used both for the SIBO web tokens here and possibly um, also for for the for AGOS. So we have basically one device identity. And then much more happening in the authorization server. We now only tell it that this device is allowed to do this or that. Um, for example, join the network or talk to that application. And now, um, and now the application does not anymore talk directly, start with an OSCO context, but establish shared key material and then goes on talking to the, uh, to the, uh, to the authorization server. And in a similar way, the um, device that joins the network still talks to the join registrar, but ships all that information that it has about who it is and why it's allowed to join the network in a single package that's sent data. Um, there's, another, there's another trip back, um, which, start, um, which is basically to ensure that we have a, hand, we have a cryptographic handshake, um, a fresh, um, fresh Diffie-Hellman exchange. And from there on, just after two messages, uh, communication about the actually used key material can go on. I promised to put that into context of Riot, and I hope, although probably not on short term, like not this year, that most of these components can be implemented in Riot. Um, now, 6 dish we already have in parts, constraint joining protocol should really not be too hard to add, especially now that OSCOR with the discussion in tomorrow's breakout session is hopefully um, getting more usable on Riot. Uh, we already have uh, uh, we already have good for support for Cozy. We have border router. We have border routers. I think that we can even implement the join register and coordinator on a maybe a bit beefier, but still very constrained device. And only the authorization server is something that is probably out of scope for Riot, because that would more likely be something like a cell phone or something, or uh, if you're in some kind of um, vendor managed um, vendor managed infrastructure, some somewhere in their data center. Uh, with that, thanks for having me here, and I'll go back in a moment to the last slide because I hope that there will be questions, and my gut feeling is that those will be around. Those. Thank you. All right, thanks, Christian, for this very informative talk. Um, I think especially the last picture was a very great reminder that security is happening on all the layers. And it's very recent and, and active uh, at the ITF. So do we have uh, talks from the, uh, sorry, uh, questions from the audience? So there's one question from Jürgen in the chat. Does ad hoc use some kind of public key infrastructure like X509? Um, not um, not on its own. So I'll just let me just um, skip back here to um, to ad hoc. Um, ad hoc um, can use certificates, um, but ad hoc can just as well use uh, raw, uh, use basically the, just the public key as materials, which is kind of indicated by this. Uh, so you could, it could be certificates. Uh, it could be um, could be just public keys. And even when it comes to certificates, there is a great deal of flexibility in there. So it can process X509 certificates. It can also process certificates encoded in uh, in Seabor, but that's not really a, a feature of ad hoc. So at least from, 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 from my implementation point of view in ad hoc, um, <clears throat> if you're doing ad hoc and are working with certificates, then what happens is that you ask that party that does certificates, um, which might be, for example, the X509 library or, or your, um, your web, um, web PKI root of trust, what that certificate actually means in terms of public key. And then continue from that. Also, the certificates are typically not transported in ad hoc itself, but just referenced. OK, so there's another question from Peter Kiesmann. Um... The question is, are you aware of ongoing coding effort in the area of ACE OAuth, also besides Riot? Um, 
Not personally. Um, I'd have to ask that to people um, more directly involved with ACE, uh, more, more actively involved with that. All right. Um, um, but I'll take I'll take that down for. Um, so I've, I've, I'm I'll be assembling a few kind of Q and A stuff um, items on the talk page for later. So if you come back, um, I hope that there will be an answer there. Okay, so we have two more questions in the chat. The first one is uh, from Hannes Schiffening. Do you think developers should try to create security IoT products on their own or rather use dedicated IoT security firms? Um, I think that depends on the on the, that that depends on the on the goals of the project, and I hope that with projects like Riot, um, we can get um, implementation can get implementations from professionals in the field um, into standard components like Riot so that they would then be usable for the for the general users. All right, uh, last question from Matthew. Uh, does group OSCOR intend to support multicasting digitally signed messages that are not encrypted? Um, I don't think so. Um, that would um, that would require. Yeah, th that, that's that's not really that's not really planned. Um, I do see where this might be handy, um, but right now I don't see that. Um, that I don't think that is supported. Okay, there's a. But if you do have also. use case. If you do have use cases, um, please bring them to the uh, to the call list because they might still shape what um, what what gets added in there. Okay. There's also um, two comments from from Marco and Olaf uh, that there are like other um, ACE OAuth implementations like besides Ride. Uh, you can find this in the chat. Thank you. So there's, uh, okay, that's a question directed to Hannes, actually. Um, what would be the answer to your question if you remove the term IoT from it? But I guess that's not relevant here. Um, so we hit the time. Um, if there are, like, no more questions directed to Christian, then I guess we can go on. I'll be around okay. and gather time for the remainder of the summit. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Christian. Uh, so, actually, we are lucky. In the last talk uh, of the session, uh, this is presented by two speakers, uh, Jan Roman and Hugo Damer, uh, study, computer, study computer science um, at the University of Bremen. Um, and within the student project uh, NAMI, uh, which stands for Network Access Makes IoT Better, they are dealing with security and interoperability issues uh, of the IoT where they focus on self-description 